I did not think sulfuric acid or just the volcanic miasma would appear within this episode. Honestly, it appeared at such a great time, but at the same time, it's unsettling in a way because of just how active the volcano has been. With how much, uh, I guess, gas is coming out of it, it's definitely not a good sign, especially with just how far it's reaching. I don't know necessarily because like, I, I don't know a lot about volcanoes, so to say. I just, I don't think it's probably normal to have that much gas coming out from the volcano that far away from it in such an extent. It feels like there's something going on. Unless just the wind is dragging it in such a degree with heavy wind that it's causing that. There, there definitely is something happening with the volcano. But for now, I'll leave it at that. So anyways... If there is one thing that this episode does that I'm just so proud of, it is properly getting what's super important in warfare. Now, when you think of the most dangerous thing in warfare, you would think that nukes would be the, the greatest weapon of all time. Because someone like Yin actually even say, like, you're not talking about nukes, are you? And that's why he got so scared, is because nukes is just not something you play around with and honestly like I've said already and it's not discussion I really want to dive too deep into nukes is definitely something that's probably caused such a long period of peace throughout the world peace is not perfect by any means within our current society and our world but it's better than probably it's ever been because of just the presence of what a nuke is but before the nukes there is definitely something to this very day and even to this day is probably one of the most powerful forms of warfare and that is communication now this seems very obvious but when you go back to traditional warfare back in the past communication was not easy it was actually extremely hard and as much as the movies and theaters etc like to make it seem like leading a giant army of a hundred thousand men is easy it's really not honestly there is so many issues of leading just a large group a large army that it's just not easy without some form of mind-bending magic or a really good source of communication and that's pretty much what Senku is doing he is creating communication devices which is pretty much a walkie-talkie he's gonna be creating a phone aka walkie-talkie to be able to tell people what is going on and let me kind of get into the details of why this will work why this is very important he does explain within the episode why it's important but it's a very bare bones explanation with not a whole lot of context to explain why something like a walkie-talkie would be very important like I said it's obvious why but there is so many details to it, which is why no matter the numbers you would have, you can't really stand up to good communication. So I want to take kind of an example from Kingdom. If you've ever read the manga Kingdom, then you'll know what I'm about to talk about. If you haven't, don't worry, I'm going to explain. So in Kingdom, it's obviously a warfare manga series. It's, it's a basically a depiction of ancient warfare in China. And you have it to where there's multiple large armies going up against each other, and usually how some of these fights turn out is because one enemy is able to outsmart each other, but also because the communication is on such a higher level that they're able to quickly mobilize in such a quick extent to be able to counter the enemy. And usually the way this is done is through towers. Example, have you ever seen, let's say, in a warfare type scenario, you'll notice that maybe sometimes generals, like of an army, etc., will be on top of a mountain overlooking the entire battlefield and then they'll have people they talk to like hey go and so say this so and so say this and they'll have their carriers go off and talk to people their generals and stuff uh, inside of the army this is something you see quite a bit within kingdoms manga series and it pretty much states that communication is key being able to control a, fa uh, a army of a hundred thousand fifty thousand or even a thousand is incredibly hard it's not something easy whatsoever and the larger the army, the harder it is for the orders from the Supreme Commander to give to everyone else. So, example, let's say there's a large army. They're in a gigantic field fighting back and forth, okay? And you have the general on top that's able to see the entire situation of what's going on in the battlefield because he's higher up. His elevation is way higher, so he's able to see it. 
But even though he knows what's going on, relaying that information in a proper fashion is incredibly hard in ancient days of warfare. Because even though, let's say, an enemy's coming from the left side and all, you see them coming to flank you from the left and all that, and you have the Supreme Commander tell his carrier, like, okay, I want you to counter that left flank, go around and do so-and-so, that's what the general says, but then as the general says that, the message, the messenger that's supposed to relay that information to the frontline soldiers is delayed by 5 minutes to 10 minutes, or it just takes 10 to 15 minutes to get there, and because of how long that took, that information didn't get in time to really stop the flank from coming in, or even if it got there in somewhat of an orderly fashion, there wasn't enough time to truly prep for a counterattack. So that's the point here, is communication is one of the strongest forms of warfare, because if you're able to accurately communicate in an instant, it really changes the entire battlefield. A fraction of a size of a large army can defeat something of a hundred thousand men. For instance, if you have a fraction of a hundred thousand, you probably get defeated if you have very, very, very good communication. And that's kind of the point here is that no matter the numbers that Tsukasa wants to throw at Senku and his group, as long as if they have communication and are able to understand where the enemy is at a certain point in time, they will be able to win. They will be able to instantaneously know their opponent's whereabouts. So there you go. I, I know it's very long-winded, I know many might not care about that, but it's just a scientific and realistic historical reason to why communication is to this very day the most powerful weapon besides, let's say, something like the nuke, because just information. Which is why the internet is actually so valuable to this day is because of something like communication. So uh, enough with that, let's, uh, let's talk about the other stuff. So. One of the big other details that this episode wanted to present is that the villagers, they have lost their entire village. They have lost all their buildings, and if there's one thing that they can breathe a sigh of relief for is that at least it was just buildings. A city can be rebuilt. People cannot be replaced, so to say. The people you lose cannot be replaced, cities can be rebuilt. So, even though it's a major loss, it can be rebuilt, which is kind of why Senku's so important, because it, while he's there as a person, science can be reborn. Science continue can continue to exist. It's technically not theoretically zero possibility of humanity ever rising back to what it once was. So that's why Senku is such a very important aspect of the story, and why he's more important than, let's say, a, you know, a village or a, a buildings, because as long as he's around, everything can be rebuilt. That is a fundamental reason why he's so crucial, and why Tsukasa wants him gone. So, buildings, it's not a big, it's a setback, but it's nothing too big. As long as Senku is around, and he has some of the manpower to be able to do it, he will be able to continuously produce what he can with his scientific technology to be able to counter Tsukasa. Now, the thing is, though, because of them losing what they lost, they don't really have as strong of fortifications against invaders anymore, because when it came to those islands, there was one big fundamental thing about it that really made it strong, and that was, is that it was on an island, kind of not connected to the mainland, besides just through bridge, which meant that invading that island would be extremely hard. The only reason why the island fell in the first place was because they didn't have enough warriors really stationed to watch any invaders to sneak in up the sheer cliff and the rocks to stop the fires. So if someone would have been stationed to watch the sides, it would have been a lot easier. But once again, I highly doubt anyone normally would have came up with that idea, so that's why it wasn't really covered. So honestly, if I'm Senku, what I would do, I would tell the villagers to build a wall around the edge of the island to where you can't just scale up the rock wall. Make some form of dangerous traps, etc. Like some form of wooden spikes to be able to make it where people can't actually get up the rock wall. If they do that, they can definitely safeguard one of their main potential aspects of where they're fighting at. Obviously, though, Senku says he's going to take the fight to Tsukasa, but one day there's going to be another reason for them to probably use the advantage, the geological advantage of where their main town is to their advantage, because war does happen. War always happens in human society, so because of that fundamental main, main thing that is factual, you know, making fortifications on the island just seems like they should do eventually. I definitely can see Senku saying something like that, but for the time being, though, I do think that, uh, they, um, they're definitely having to prepare as quickly as possible. They need to make their radios, because they, they have some time, but not enough. 
because right now what Sukas is going to be doing with his group is pretty much uh, building an army. Because the more people he has, the more numbers he can throw at Senku, the less Senku's weapons of t uh, technology, science, and all that can really fight back. And here's the reason why. Why it's so fundamentally important. Let's say Senku, he makes 50 guns, okay? He makes 50 guns all loaded with ammo. To be honest, he doesn't have enough time to give everybody a gun and enough ammo to be able to fight back against, let's say, a thousand people. There's just no way, you know, someone like Senku can really get enough weapons to fight back. So because of that fundamental reason, that is why Sukasa is just going to continue to revive people because the more people he revives, the bigger his army, the more people that he could just sling up against Senku and die, and it drains his ammunition. It's basically an endurance game, and as more ammunition and everything kind of goes undone, eventually their for fortifications will become weakened, and they could just come in and just stomp all over them because Sukasa has the advantage. He has the number game, and he has the ability to continuously replenish his forces. So, for instance, when Senku's group loses, let's say, one person, if one person dies, that's a major loss, because they can't just get people back. It would take too much time just to revive one individual, while someone like Tsukasa can revive probably 10 to 20 people a day, maybe, or even more than that. So, you, you understand what I'm getting at, is that it just they're not in a good situation, so they need to strike first, and they need to get rid of the head of the snake before anything else. So, uh... Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much the fundamentals of what this episode's about. Another thing to really kind of get into, though, is once again Magma and just his interaction with the group. Once again, Magma, he's still a part of Senku's group, which is just so strange to me because of just how much of an enemy he was in the previous arc. And seeing him working with Senku and everybody, talking to Gen, etc., it just makes you wonder, like... You know, how much development is someone like Magma going to get? For him to be around at this point, is he going to prove to be an issue in the future? Is he going to change and start respecting Senku? There's so many questions I have, but for the time being, though, I do think that just having Magma a part of the group and working with him is just so weird to me. And by the way, speaking of which, I do think that the whole gas situation is something that uh, is being used to Senku's advantage as well, because... You have it to where they can use the gas to make it seem like they have gas weapons where nobody will come at them. And so Sukasa and everybody else will be a little bit more cautious. Obviously, I don't think Sukasa is that dumb in any means. So I do think eventually he will figure out that there is volcanic activity that is ca uh, causing it. And he'll be able to counter it overall. But yeah. So I think I want to leave it at that. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you uh, enjoy my content, you know, please subscribe. If you uh, like my video, please leave a like, and if you want to get notified for whenever I upload a video, please click the bell icon down below, because for some reason, even if you click the subscribe button, you don't always get notified, so if you want to get notified, hit that bell icon, and even if you don't do it for me, at least do it for the YouTubers you regularly watch, because it does help us out truly. And so with that, I'll leave you guys with a good night, good day, and hopefully you guys have a very great weekend and a great rest of the year. I love you guys. Chibi out.